Uh, so the, the story mm -hmm. is based on a short story by your brother. But how did he build that story? Was it chronological or not chronological? Well, my brother told me the story verbally before he'd finished writing it. And uh, the screenplay is an extrapolation of, of his basic idea, which I was fascinated by. And he told it to me while we were driving cross-country between Chicago and Los Angeles. And we both decided right away that by far the most interesting way of approaching that concept was subjectively, to tell the story in the first person. So he went off to write his uh, short story. I went off to um, you know, write the screenplay. And my solution to telling the story subjectively was to deny the audience the same information that the protagonist is denied. And my approach to doing that was to effectively tell the story backwards. That way, when we meet the character, we don't know, just like the protagonist, how he's met that person, whether he's even met that person before, or whether or not they should be trusted, that kind of thing. So the story is basically told backwards. It's basically told as a series of flashbacks that go further and further back in time. What's similar to my brother's story, as he finally finished it, it's being published next month, actually, in Esquire magazine in, in the States. And um, the similarity in structure uh, is they, that both the film and the short story deal with repetition and internal echoes. Um, and also, they both alternate between the objective and the subjective. So in the screenplay, what I did is I said, I need a way of breaking up the flashbacks so that we uh, separate the scenes in our mind and, and feel this progression further and further back in time. So what I did is I alternated between these color sequences that are intensely subjective. Everything in the color sequences is from Leonard's point of view. We're always in his head, at least to begin with. We alternate with these black and white sequences that, at least to begin with, are objective. They present a little, bit, a little bit more in a filmy way. It's black and white. It's grainy. Um, the shots are sometimes overhead, a little bit more distance. It's a more objective view. We don't hear the voice at the other end of the telephone. We're not really in his head. The voiceovers in the color sequence and the black and white sequence are very different. And the color sequence is the voice of the mind. It's the first person. It's very much his thoughts as he's thinking them. In the black and white scenes, they sound a bit like interview grabs. You know, a bit like this kind of interview, edited and laid over pictures of him in this room going about his, his life. So I wanted to introduce this almost documentary style element at the beginning of the film to give the audience a little bit of information, objective information, about how this guy lives his life and what he thinks. Um, and to break up these scenes. So the black and white sequences, the chronology is, is forward. They uh, run forward in time, as we realize as we go further and further along the film. As the film progresses, the color sequences become a little bit less intensely subjective. I think towards the end of the film, we really start to step outside his head a little bit and start to question some of the things we've been told about this character, or some of the things he's told us himself. The black and white scenes, on the other hand, as the movie progresses, they become um, less and less objective. We start to get more and more into his head as he exists in this motel room. Uh, and in fact, then the black and white and the color scenes actually meet towards the end of the movie. And I think these two perspectives, the objective and the subjective, the backwards running narrative and the forwards running narrative, they actually meet at what is the, the end of the movie. Uh, chronologically, I guess you could call it the, the middle of the movie. Uh, just to... <laughs> no, if, if, can, you, yeah. can, you make the, can you draw the line between the, the black and white scenes and the... And the now, sure. if, you, if you just put it like... No. Okay, you got... Like, uh, you've got these... Let's yeah. say the classic three acts, and then do you have the color, and then a line for uh, uh -huh. the, black, uh, the black and white, and then the flashbacks and uh, All right, the let's story. Have a go. Okay. It's confusing, Oops. because I don't think pictorially, diagrammatically. So, okay, what do you have? You have the beginning of the film here. Um, what's the best way to draw it? The best way to draw it is as a hairpin, like that. That's basically the end of the movie. This stuff is the black and white stuff. This is color. And this is running backwards as a series of jumps. 
And what we do is we cut between the two the whole way through. So we alternate scene here, scene there, scene there, scene there, scene there, scene there, scene there and they meet towards the end of the film. But then within this, you have flashbacks to a different timeline, which is actually even earlier, somewhere around there. Also within this, you have flashbacks to an earlier time, also somewhere within there. So I guess you could use the hairpin shape to represent the bulk of the film, with the black and white, with the color, meeting in the last reel, the end of the film being sort of there-ish after it turns into color and kind of leads us into the beginning of that preceding scene. But you have other material that actually precedes the beginning of the black and white scenes. And the gap between the beginning of the black and white scenes and this long-term memory stuff, some of which is color, some of which is black and white, um, that gap is unspecified. The lead character, because of his particular condition, he can never know how long that's been. He's cut loose in time, effectively. So we never wanted to specify for the audience. We imply a length of time to it, because it's the time in which he's had these tattoos put on, it's, he's been living this life, um, and so forth. So that gap, to me, is where the most interesting ambiguity of the film is, at the end. You know, we never wanted to step fully outside his head and you know, specify too many of these things in terms of an objective reality. Because to me, one of the interesting things about the film and what we were trying to do is essentially present a, uh, um, an idea of the tension between our subjective view of the world, the subjective way in which we have to experience life, and then our faith in an objective reality beyond that. And most movies present a quite comfortable universe where we're given an objective truth that we don't get in everyday life. That's one of the reasons we go to the movies. Um, this film, we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to step outside his head. We wanted to present the audience with that problem effectively and say he can't ever get outside his head and recognize what the objective truth is. Um, so I think the audience at the end of the film uh, is left to make certain of the same judgments that he is. The, invited to uh, believe or disbelieve certain elements of, of um, what is supposed to have happened in his life, much as, as he is. Um, and I think the way that, that we try and um, focus on, on this end of the film and making that as extreme as possible is by taking this subjective view and this objective view and effectively having them meet at the end so that what we achieve is still subjective, but with enough objective information built into it that we start to question the point of view that we've been given for the whole film. So that's about it. But uh, film is written, of course. If mm -hmm. you have the flashbacks and the story, where do you choose the moment to build it in, 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 your, uh, in this hairpin structure? Well, within the hairpin structure, we have different elements of his past life that we want to introduce. And we, the way we divided them is that certain of them are presented in, in black and white. And those are the ones that relate to a parallel story that runs parallel to his life. But it's the story of another character who has the same condition. And that is all presented chronologically and cuts into the black and white scenes not into the color scenes. The memories of his longer term life, his own life, the life within his own head, therefore also to me, you know, the, the subjective experience, um, these, these sort of memories of his wife, these images of his wife, are all shot in color and are all presented in the color sequences, not in the black and white sequences. So we keep those separate. Um, but as you may have noticed towards the end of the movie, there is a certain amount of um, joining of these images and confusion of these images and some of the things we've only seen in in color are presented in black and white and vice versa so uh, certainly once again we're trying to basically merge the subjective and the objective the memory versus the sort of narrative that he has in his head of this other of this other character so um, the other thing we wind up doing in the end in terms of the way in which we mix images and, and reinterpret images is to suggest uh, the complex relationship between 
imagination and memory. Um, and we see him towards the end. We present certain images that we've seen from his past life within a different context. And in a different context, they have a slightly different meaning. And I think the suggestion there is that um, he, like all of us, is able to manipulate the meanings of certain memories or, or manipulate his own interpretations of certain memories according to his present circumstance. Uh, could you say that every time you interrupt the movie for a black and white scene, mm -hmm. uh, that the colors, the color parts are scenes, complete scenes, separated? Yes. The, uh, the way in which we cut between these two things is we'll take a, a color scene and then we'll cut to a black and white scene that's shorter in length and then we come back to the color scene and we basically, as these are going essentially backwards in time, we're sort of leapfrogging and we wind up repeating the beginning of a scene at the end of another scene and vice versa. Uh, and in that way we use repetitions of certain parts of scenes to clue the audience into where they are chronologically. Um, so essentially what we're always doing is we're beginning every scene with something of a cliffhanger something of an unusual situation or a memorable image. Um, and then in a later scene, we're explaining how that situation has been arrived at. And that's the rhythm of the film over the, the entire course of the movie. Um, so it's, it's in a way taking a, a familiar cinematic rhythm, you know, the rhythm of the, the, uh, the cliffhanger or the question and then the answer. And it's presenting that as an alternating rhythm the whole way through the film. And the black and white? Uh, and let's say the black and white parts, if you have put them together, can you say that this is a sequence, one sequence? Yeah, the black and white stuff is all derived from a forward running sequence. So if you take these individual black and white scenes, they run forwards, if you stick them together, they actually overlap in the same way that the backwards scenes overlap. It's not quite so obvious when you're watching the movie, but you know, it begins with him sort of shaving his thigh and answering the phone and everything, and in fact, these actions overlap. So there is a suggestion that in fact, and, and it is the case, that you can stick all these scenes together and achieve one sort of long scene effectively. Um, and that episodic structure um, was one that I wanted to employ because the uh, overlapping flashbacks of the color sequences. It's a very complex structure. The uh, black and white stuff is actually pretty simple to follow because it follows the basic episodic structure we're all very familiar with. I mean, from watching TV, you know, it's like you, you break something up with TV commercials, you know, what have you. But it's very easy to just keep following a very simple um, forward progression. In this case, it's, it's him on his own in a room speaking on a telephone. So it's a very uh, simple sequence of, of, of uh, forward progression. And it's not too difficult as we return to it to just tap back into it and say, okay, this is where we are. We're back here on familiar ground. We're just going to get a bit more information about, um, you know, who he is and, uh, you know, what he's discussing on, the, on this telephone call. In the beginning, uh, you give information to the audience that the story is backwards. Mm -hmm. And in, especially in the beginning, you get a little bit more. You go over, let's say, the scene, mm -hmm. and you overlap it. But at a certain moment, you stop. But, yes. But, when, <laughs> but the thing is, when? Uh, because how do you know that the audience will, be, will get it at that time? Well, the overlaps become shorter as the film progresses, because the audience, the assumption is, and it seems to work, that the audience gets into the kind of rhythm. They begin to understand that the structure is backwards. We, in fact, begin the film with a literally backwards scene at the head. I mean, we're literally running reverse action. The rest of the film is forward action, but in a series of backward steps. It's kind of, you know, one step forward, two steps back the whole way through. Um, but at a certain point, those repetitions are able to be a little bit shorter because the audience is in the rhythm. And then there is a point at which, in certain scenes, we actually don't achieve the same repetition. We actually make an elision, you know, we make a, a complete jump. The same way in a conventional movie, they will do that. Um, you know, when you reach a point where two scenes so obviously connect chronologically, so you don't have to explain the chronological relationship. So there's a point 
sort of you know midway through the film where we begin to do that a little bit. Um, but then we come back to the repetitions because some of the repetitions later in the film, I think, um, are important for their own sake. Not just for explaining to the audience where we are, but also for hammering home this notion that it's the context of a scene. It's the context um, within which a particular action happens. Like him, there's a point at which he's searching for a pen and he's trying to write something down and remember something and all the rest. And, we see that once and we don't really understand it and we see it again it has a rather different meaning. So those repetitions start to take on a more substantial uh, role I think in, in the narrative other than just orienting us you know, in time. Uh, they actually start to suggest the way in which um, the, uh, the narrative context in which a particular action happens is changing what that action represents. Um, and that relates once again to his subjective view of you know what he's doing in the world and how that's actually affected by what's going on around him which becomes I think very important to the overall uh, theme of the movie. Uh, the first thing could you, uh, the first shot actually, the, the, the Polaroid mm -hmm. is going backward. Okay. Uh, could you say that's the metaphor for uh, the whole movie in a certain way that he's like his memory is fading well, at the beginning of the movie, I was looking for a way into this uh, structure, the way into this storytelling. So what I wanted to do was to show something in reverse to suggest the, the backwards movement of the film. Um, but the way in which the Polaroid is used through the film is to, as a replacement for a short-term memory. So it seemed like showing a, a Polaroid picture undeveloping, showing him, him or showing the picture undeveloping, showing this information being lost. It seemed like a very useful way of suggesting the problem that he's having to deal with, which is, you know, this faulty short-term memory, this information dribbling away. And in fact, the, the opening shot, is, you know, it's a Polaroid of a, of a dead body. Um, and I think the significance of that becomes clear later in the movie in terms of how I was interested in looking at the relationship of revenge to the, you know, the relationship of his perception of revenge versus the notion of whether it has any objective uh, reality, or whether it has any value outside his own head. So this idea of you know, this, this achievement of revenge, this satisfaction, this dead body, this gruesome image fading and actually undeveloping and, and losing itself from his, his mind, that actually is, is pretty much that's the whole movie. In fact, you can just watch the opening shot and you've got the whole movie. So. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.